What's up everybody? It's Robert Hecker and today I'm going to show you how to create a copywriting portfolio. What you're looking at right here is my first copywriting portfolio courtesy of the Wayback Machine uh, from March 7th, 2018. So gosh, yeah, a little over two years ago. And I just graduated college about a year before, realized I wanted to be a copywriter, and that I needed to put a portfolio together if that's what I wanted to do full time. So I just got a WordPress site. If I don't think it shows you that it's a WordPress site, but oh, right here. Got a WordPress site. And I just created a little introduction and then just threw up my long form copy, which isn't very good. It just looks really unorganized and cluttered, and there's just really, frankly, nothing about it. I mean, I guess it was functional for the time that I needed it. But as I looked at other people's copywriting portfolios, I needed I realized they needed to be a lot more image based and look a lot more like a designer's, look a lot more accessible and just better organized. And so that's why I went to uh, Adobe. And this is not it. This is something I'm getting into later. Okay. But this is my current portfolio right now. And like I said, I got this from Adobe just because they seem to have the best, um, I guess, as you know, creators of products for designers and videographers. They understand how important um, a visual, a good visual aesthetic is. So I just went with them. I paid, I think I paid thirty bucks. I continue to pay thirty bucks a month for Adobe Suite, which also includes various portfolio templates. So it's a little bit of a pricey subscription. I mean, it's not as cheap as like a magazine subscription or anything, but in my opinion, it's well worth it just for the ease of use, how customizable it is, the support you get. Um, it's just all, in my opinion, very well worth it. Um, and on top of, before I dive into these individual, most of these individual tabs and how to format it, I also recommend not only Adobe, but I also recommend that you buy your own domain name. Uh, I think that when you have, if you were to if you just go to GoDaddy.com, type in your name, purchase the .com, um, that just, and then you connect the two, which is pretty simple. Uh, if you were to do that, it just looks really professional. You just have your name .com. If you have something like RobertHecker.wordpress.com or RobertHecker.adobeportfolio.com, it's not necessarily the most unprofessional thing. And if you're strapped for money, it's fine. But I've just noticed that it's. Every professional copywriter who takes himself seriously chooses to spend the 15 bucks a year to just get their name.com. Just super simple and I think s subtly levels up your portfolio. The last thing I want to make note of really fast is this is actually not in chronicle chronological order. Uh, my last gig was at Mariner's Church and I was very ha I was happy with the work and the experience I got there. But what's first and foremost up here is Cardboard Companion and then Pronto and then some stuff I did for a YouTube channel um, and that's just because I've realized people are drawn people were drawn to it and this was my favorite and when I brought this up in interviews I just I pointed this out as a really favorite it was one of my favorite um, experiences and so I just put that at the front the resume on this side does need to be in chronological order but the portfolio itself doesn't need to be Let's dive into this. So this is how I usually format most of my copywriting um, samples. At the top we have the title obviously, we have my role, we have a summary of the product itself, and Cardboard Companion by the way is a game, board game database app, kind of like Pinterest for your board games where you can yeah, just collect and create different galleries for your board games. Um, then I wrote very simple description of my role and then I wrote who um, the guy who was on my team who did the design. I also worked with an engineer too so I should probably throw his name up there but you guys want to just rule of thumb do a summary role team. Then below I included some buttons which link to other pages and I'll throw that in later. I'll explain that later. Um, I'm sure back doesn't need to be explained. But below the buttons, I have the onboarding sequence that I scripted. So when people log in, what do you write? What do you say? How do you greet them? How do you get their information in a fun and compelling way? Obviously, 
This looks really simple, but there's a lot of back and forth. There were three or four, maybe even five iterations to getting this right and getting this to a, a place where the engineer and the, the, I guess, CEO, if you will, really liked it. And then down here is the review section, uh, the review sequence that I also created and edited. Again, very simple, but these are my two. Fa these took a lot of work, and I'd be happy. I'm gonna, and if I were in an interview, I'd explain that. I'd, I'd get into the the whys behind of all, all of that. And then below the review sequence, I have um, just some cool product shots of the de design itself to give people an idea of what it looks like and what it feels like. And um, I mean, it's obviously really well done and even though I didn't have anything to do with the art direction I am just really proud of the designer I got to work with and I think that the product shots themselves elevate the work that we all did and you know I'm that can that can't hurt you and you know as long as I give credit to the designer up here then I think it's totally fine but like I said I have some buttons um, first is view web page so this is the site itself if it loads Dun, 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 dun. And to be completely honest, I uploaded this on Dropbox and linked to my portfolio, again, which is very easy. And in all honesty, I could have just put the web page here, but from what I remember, it was just kind of showing out of proportion. It just looked odd on here. So my backup plan was to just link to Dropbox so viewers and you know people looking at my portfolio could pretty easily still access it. Um, if the site was live, then I would just send a direct link to the site itself. And then as you can see, there's another button right here, View UX Writing Case Study. So in this, I link to Dropbox Paper and go into much greater detail of the role I played and how I contributed to the team at Dropbox, um, sorry, at, at Cardboard Companion. So I start here. This just gives a table of contents, a summary of the problem and solution, a great, you know, breaks down on my role and then we get into a voice guide yeah which if I remember correctly um, this links to a presentation a Google slides deck that I shared with the team to you know align our copywriting and then it also just gets into the different iterations um, and the taxonomies and how we set up the how we set up the nav menu and all that stuff so I didn't want to include all of that in here because I just wanted to preserve the main idea. So that's why I used Dropbox Paper, which again, I can't recommend that enough. If you have like a presentation and you just need something really quick, you can't go wrong with Dropbox Paper. And then if you want to go, I go back and I get to the Pronto Pay web app that I worked on. Um, and this is actually. And this one's pretty similar to um, Cardboard Companion, as you can tell. I actually, in fact, worked with the same designer for the for the on the on a yeah with the same designer, um, different engineer for a different product. But again, I just have summary, my role, the team. Then I have a few more buttons. View the pitch deck. So this is what we obviously pitch people with, and that I played a slight role in editing and tweaking the copy to make it sound. Uh, to just help it resonate with the audience. View a case study, same thing as Cardboard Companion, and then view web page. And the web page actually um, it links to a live site, not a not a screenshot of it. I mean, I think just this looks really, really good. I'm really proud of how that turned out. Um, and then below it, I have the UX writing, and I've kept the mock-ups because I helped with the, you know, I call, I helped, you know, determine do we keep it in sentence case or title case? Um, what do we call these, you know, buttons right here? What do we call this button down here? And that just goes on for a while about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for a while um, of, you know, again, what do I, what do we call settings? Do we call that, do we stick with that or do we change something else? Do we call this monthly statements? Do we call it something else? Um, so there's just a lot of back and forth and conversation and dialogue about what each word looks like. So again, nothing super different from Cardboard Companion itself. Although, actually, let me go back here. Um, a helpful tip is that, is it down here? I think it is. With, oh, here we go. Um, help videos, walkthroughs, and FAQs. 
if you're especially trying to get into UX writing, I mean, that seems like stuff they don't really think a copywriter does or a UX writer does, but uh, it's really helpful to have these two because it just shows people that you can do the high level stuff and also the nitty gritty directional stuff that just provides the real value to people. If they're frustrated with something, well, let's go to this video, how to give a one-time gift and stuff like that. So I also have a few buttons down here um, of where people can access the kind of FAQ work I did. And then along with that, I have social media copy, which is just a static Instagram page that I wrote the copy for as well. And I think this also links to the Instagram, right? Oh, looks like, oh, well, oh, here we go. Oh, there's stories. Okay, cool. But it's basically the same. Um, let me scroll down. So anyways, there's that, that people can see. And I also want to point out that, actually I don't think I want to point anything else out. I think that's good. <laughs> um, let's go back. Church front, that's just some content I wrote. Um, I also want to point out, so stick on Dropbox for a second here. This is actually uh, spec work or assignment work. Uh, the, the history behind that is I was, I made it through what, three or four rounds and a Dropbox interview for a UX writer. And I flew up there, met the team, five hour interview is great. Everybody was super nice, but ultimately didn't make it. Um, but I, when I when I left, I you know knew I still wanted to work in, maybe work with UX still. Um, and by the way, I know that I'm kind of using these interchangeably, but UX and copywriting are s different, but also similar in a lot of ways. Um, and so, anyways, I knew that I wanted to get into UX writing. I knew that the assignment that I'd created them for them was still pretty cool, and I put a lot of work into it. So I figured I'm going to throw that into my portfolio. Uh, because I'm very happy with it. And as you can see, the format's a little different uh, just because, I don't know, I didn't see the point and just, I don't know, I just wanted to change it up. It just looked better this way in my opinion. Um, but again, I just have a summary and then I go to view work. I don't need this anymore. And again, it goes to Dropbox paper, you know, launch email. I write a sentence of the of the from the brief and then here's where I have my work and the reason why I'm proud of this is because I you know basically just copied the same format and style of Dropbox um, Dropbox emails and then I designed this in Illustrator briefly and just was really happy with the icons that I did and it just looked dialed in and it looked like um, I mean a professional could probably do better but it just looked like an email that Dropbox uh, would send and then I also included the rewriting settings page part. So as a UX writer, you're obviously trying to make things as quick, functional, and concise as possible. And part of the job was to rewrite this to cut down on the wordage. And so then I, the wordage, the words. Um, and so then this is the, the settings that I created for them. This is how, this is the more concise version of that. Which, you know, as you can see, demonstrates that I understand the basic principles of UX. So that's why I kept it. And my reasoning for that is as long as you label something as spec or you know assignment work, there's no reason to not include it. Although quick pro tip slash side note, uh, if you have too much too many uh, <laughs> bits of assignment work, then people will probably notice that you haven't been able to land a job and you pr probably just view that very negatively. So I would only include like one, two max um, pieces of assignment work that uh, you're proud of. Next, we go on to Mariner's Church. So instead of, you know, contract writing like up here, this is a full-time gig that I was at for a little over a year and a half. So I had a lot of work to take away from this on the comm team. Um, and I was very happy with this work because Sometimes church work and ministry work isn't the most, I don't know, creatively appealing or competitive, but this was a church or is a church that has 20,000 members uh, with a staff of 150 plus people. So I still got a ton of really great experience with it. And as you can see, it's similar to the Dropbox one, 
I have summaries for each of my roles. This is kind of more formatted like a resume. Um, then I have examples of what I'm talking about, which, you know, in this case, I, you know, increase their subscribers by X number of percent. I link to their, I link to their Instagram. And then again, you know, communications collateral, various crisis com, change com, some social media images, just a lot of the stuff that I want to highlight that I think provided a lot of value. Um, you know, oh yeah, with coronavirus, I mean, I worked up there till, I worked there till coronavirus, so what was some of the messaging and stuff like that. So that was, um, I just wanted to include those kind of high value, um, externally focused, high visibility pieces. And I think as you can, I mean, it's basically all the same. Um, the campaigns, you know, each speaking series we had had a different campaign that we launched, which I actually, as you can see, included on a Medium um, page. Because I wrote a lot about it, I thought this would be a good way to get followers and help other churches. But honestly, that it didn't take off. And my goal for this is to transfer all this content to a Dropbox paper um, doc like you've seen for all the others. Um, I go back. And we go to Engage Media. Um, so this is actually my first gig outside of college, which just takes me back. I was a writer and editorial intern at the holding company um, of a magazine publication with 75 titles, and I wrote a ton. Um, you know, again, as you can see, I have my kind of summary and role section right here, and I only have two buttons this time. And instead of going to Dropbox Paper, I actually put these long-form articles on an issue, uh, issue site. Issue is, uh, allows you to publish um, digital magazines, which is really cool. So I just created a personal account and just put all the articles, all the feature length articles that I had written during my time at Engage Media. And as you can see, this is a very different aesthetic and a very different audience than, you know, Cardboard Companion and Pronto. But this demonstrates that I can sustain a thought. I can work kind of more for a, an older audience. Um, you know, I can, I can come up with titles. And so this demonstrates, I mean, it's a little dated. My writing obviously isn't the best in this, but it's, uh, I'm still very proud of it. And I got to work with a lot of really cool brands like uh, World Market and Ikea for some like native print advertising. So that was a lot of fun. Very proud of that work. A uh, quick note about issue actually is that when I had a friend review this in my portfolio, I they noticed that when you're scrolling through, when he was scrolling through, um, there are various ads that pop up. So that's part of how you know issue makes money, um, which he knows from his own experience will kind of might frustrate some people. So just wanted to give you a fair warning about that. And then I also want to point out that. Um, this is the only magazine article I have in a mock-up. Um, you know, a mock-up is, uh, you know, what does it, this, uh, this, this, these two images, this was, this, I did not take this picture. I dropped the PDFs or the PNGs of this magazine into a mock-up here. Really fast, I'll just show you what that looks like because um, I'm not explaining it well. Mock-up magazine, if I can spell. So you can download these for free and just drop them in here. Um, and I, I, I recommend for some things, if you want to create a very, you know, visual, um, visually appealing look and environment, if you have something specific in mind, then by all means, download it into, you know, Photoshop or something. And, uh, and yeah, drop your, drop your pieces in there. But quick warning about that is I wanted... I put mine in issue because I wanted people to be able to read it. As you can tell, you can't really, yeah, you can't read that writing at all. Um, and as I've spoken with different creative directors, um, some of them have mentioned, you know, they don't like mock-ups at all. They just want to see the work that you did without some sort of arbitrary background and environment. Um, they want to judge the work on its own merits, which I think is fair. Um, but again, depending on your audience and the clientele you want to land, uh, you know, choose wisely about w if you use mockups or not. And then that's kind of the broad overview of how to format each um, piece. I mean, the future and the church front, those aren't that exciting. Those look the same. 
but we'll get up here to the navigation menu. So obviously I titled this section work. And you get into the resume part, which is just a PDF of my resume that Adobe links to. And it's uploaded into Google Docs. Um, and it's a little, I mean, so I'll get into all this content later. But quick note, I chose Google Docs for this instead of Dropbox because um, Dropbox was having issues with their links and I had some problems with that and I mean I don't know nothing against Dropbox it's great but I just noticed it was hard, for whatever reason it was hard to get to this and I was kind of having some trouble and honestly I might transfer the stuff that's on Dropbox um, like the web the web page that's on Dropbox to a Google Doc or a Google link anyways that was kind of a ramble but as you can see, I have my name, my bio, my contact info, my skills, education, and then my experiences. And most of the time, this should be in some pretty, it should be in chronological order for the most part. Um, when it comes to writing, you know, start from your most recent, go all the way to the, you know, to the, to the earliest copywriting experience you have. Um, I also taught ESL in China, which has very little to do with writing, a lot to do with communication but very little to do with copywriting itself. So I just put that in a section called additional experience. And I will dive into that and how to create a good resume later. But anyways, that's pretty self-explanatory, the resume. Then we get to the hello section, which is the bio. And this is where I've noticed, you know, people can find out more about you, um, what you enjoy, and it's really just a place where you tell a fun story about who you are. Um, it should typically be fun, but depending on the companies and clients you're trying to land, like I said, maybe you want to try to be more formal. Um, like I, I mean, as you can probably tell from this picture of a giant tarantula, uh, this is definitely more fun. <laughs> um, sharing my experience about international travel. Um, and it's just like... Yeah, I don't, I don't really talk too much about, oh, this is the value I can add. That's more for the resume. And then down here I have my email and my LinkedIn page, which you can, you know, click on. Um, I used to have, like, my Instagram stuff, my Facebook, my Medium stuff, but I just, I don't know, that was just too much. So I figured, you know, uh, just, just throw them these two things that are probably the most pertinent to the, to the viewer. Uh, additionally... I've eaten three scorpions and you can watch me do that, which is a lot of fun. We won't do that though, but you can click on these and watch me eat a tarantula and put that in my mouth. So that's fun. And speaking of fun, we're going to the last section called fun. So something helpful about, this is kind of up to you. I mean, everything so far has been up to you, but people like to see that you have, you know, a life outside of work. They want to see your other hobbies and talents and how you've developed over the years. And so as you can see, this is where I've included my other interests and hobbies, uh, headline challenge, some doodles I've done, and publications that I've obviously published. The headline, these two aren't super built out. Um, I'm at, in fact, I'm not even finished with the headline challenge. But you click here, and then you go to the project, which is just my Medium page with... There we go, that's a featured one, but with the headlines I've done. And I can get more into the lessons I learned from that later. And then I go back, and then doodles. I mean, I like to draw. I think, you know, this obviously, this needs to be, this might need to be built out a little bit more, but sometimes I draw, haha. -ha. And it's just a Google website, and it's images of stuff that I've drawn randomly. Um, you know, you don't need to include that kind of stuff, but I like to do it. It's fun. It's a place to put it instead of just like letting it take up space on, you know, some Google account or something. And then here's publications, which is probably the section I'm most proud of. Um, it's it's self-explanatory. I mean, it just has all the articles I've published on different sites from Film Fisher, um, where I write about film, to UX Collective on Medium, where I write about, obviously, UX writing, Obviously, I write about writing, and then here's some miscellaneous things that weren't necessarily <clears throat> published on Medium, but um, got featured by the editors. So that's kind of about all it takes to create a copywriting portfolio. 
Uh, it obviously took me a lot longer because I was kind of doing this trial by fire thing where I'd go through different iterations, you know, and do try different techniques. But this is what I've landed at. This is what um, usually gets the most clicks. This is what makes me look really professional. And like I said, um, before you can get people to read your words, this is true for all copywriting, it just has to look readable, has to look engaging. If they just see a dense block of text, they're going to be turned off and bored. So, um, yeah, that, that, that about wraps up the copywriting portfolio walkthrough. Uh, thanks again for watching this, and if you dig the video, feel free to like and subscribe. And then join me next week uh, as I show you how to get your writing and edits approved by stakeholders. That's a super important task that I don't think people know how to go about it in an objective, effective way. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And I hope, I'm pretty sure it'll provide a ton of value for people out there. So see you next week.